Um, last year we were doing any kind of fraction, whatever we could with them. This year they're limiting us to certain fractions. Now, in my opinion, is that that's just the way I've always taught it. And they'll be tested on a limited number of fractions. But I really think if you know the concept one way, you can apply it to anything. So, um, <laughs> anyway, I just think that our students are really capable. Oh, God, she's getting it. Go away. Um, <laughs> she was joking. <laughs> class where I can see what they can do. So as the days go on, I'm seeing where we have some gaps. And I do see some gaps in knowing that, but I'm getting stuck. So um, anyway, that's where we are right now. We're working on volume. So I've prepared a few things for you. One thing, the sheet I made, I know it looks lengthy, but if you have time to read it, I do not give time tests. I think they're super stressful, and they don't really show what a child knows, because a lot of people don't produce something fast. They, they need to process it. And that, means, that doesn't mean they're any worse student than anybody else. Some of my slower processors will make those things. So I don't give time tests. Um, what I do is just kind of watch what they do in class, and I can sort of see where their weaknesses are. But um, that being said, I'm not going to be able to tell you your kid is at this ranking with doing their math facts. Um, but you can know that about your child by being in the car and saying, hey, hey you lost six times seven. And if he can produce 42, and then a couple minutes later you ask him something else, you know he's pretty good. If he goes, um, you know he needs to be working really hard. Because they start multiplication in third grade, they work on fourth grade. We're now in fifth grade, and we have people who, after, I mean, I'll be honest with you, six times two is a struggle. So when you're at that point, and you have to go into you know, equivalent fractions and multiplying fractions and things like that, it's really, really hard. Especially equivalents, because when you don't see um, relationships between numbers, because you don't know those facts really, really hard to think through this. The other day, I had the children learn how to get volume on their own. They built prisms. We looked at the length, width, and height. We wrote that down. And then they counted the cubes. And then I said, what do you notice? And some of them immediately saw the numbers and saw the number of cubes and said, this is multiplying. Some of the kids saw no connection between the numbers at all. And that's math facts. So I really feel like it's important for us to get there. But I love when they can come up with the process themselves. They remember it better than me saying, here's how you do it. So that's kind of how I teach. Um, <clears throat> so am I talking too fast? Am I really yeah, good for y'all? OK, so what I've um, given for y'all, these are take homes. Mm -hmm. I love cheap. Um, I grew up just making do with whatever. <laughs> so that's kind of how I do now. I made, um, this is called Flip It. And I just got popsicle sticks and wrote the, the 10 digits on it, 0 through 9. And I've got in your baggie the directions for five different games. The first game is basically addition, but adding more than two numbers. So having to hold a lot in your head. And they can do it on paper as well. The second game is subtraction from 100. The third game is multiplying. Um, the fourth game, you get to choose whether you're going to add all the sticks that land face up or multiply two of them. And if they're really competitive kids, they're going to understand that I'm going to get more points if I start multiplying. <laughs> so I need to learn this stuff. Game five is related to what one of our next units is, and that's order of operations. So that's where you flip your sticks. You pick a target number, like my example here is I say, okay, 39 is our target. Flip your sticks, take the numbers that pop up, and see if you can make a multi-operational equation that gets close to that target number using adding, subtracting, multiplying, and dividing. So, um, I don't know. That's kind of challenging, but it can also be fun. And I, if you can get kind of competitive with them at home, maybe they'll really be uh, motivated to learn them more. I'll be honest with you. I don't have time during class, and I put that on the paper. And I've been, I, I'm down to about 50, 55 minutes now. I used to have an hour 20 minutes with these kids. When I had Alex, it was an hour 20. Now I'm down to 55 minutes. There is not time for me to practice math facts. I'll be honest with you. I'm trying to get those kind of things on our belt, so I'm really depending on you guys to help me. 
helping me get these kids up to speed on their facts um, so that they can do what we're doing in class. I can tell them and assign it for homework. It's all honor code. And I, I can tell it doesn't happen consistently. So on the back of your page also, because kids love computers, I've, I've included some websites. Um, some things are just flashcard websites. There's one that's an arcade game with the cars and you're racing another player trying to get the facts before they do. Um, the quick strike math. Did you ever get that to work, John? No, I didn't. I didn't, I didn't work on the single fly. It downloaded. I got it on my phone, but Christian, it's just at the beginning, I guess it was all like really basic, like adding and subtracting stuff. And you can choose. There's like four operations oh. on the first uh, thing, and you can choose to okay. do multiple things. The reason I like this game, especially if you're driving in the car, it uh, it works with familiarity, which is really good. Um, like if you do seven times nine, you don't have to produce the answer, but the answer is floating around with other answers. So if they see it, they can hit it, um, and that just that seems to work well with students who just bring it up because so, the number is there. Um, next week, I'm going to be sending home in your purple folders uh, the sign-on for a, a program called Freckles, and it allows them to take diagnostic tests in every standard. And then it places them where they can fill in gaps by working on the program. But again, that has to be consistent. So my suggestion somewhere in here, if you see those weaknesses in your children, uh, then you say, hey, you want to play Fortnite today? you got to get 15 or 20 minutes on the computer first. That's your entrance ticket to be able to play the game. I really, I, I, I want us to, our kids to really know that they have to be responsible for doing the serious stuff as well as the games. I love games, but um, uh, uh, over the years, y'all had to learn your facts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And somebody made you do it, so that's, that's just kind of where we are. Um, anyway, everybody can take a flip it game. The other game that is available, I don't have a lot of them, but I can make more if you want them. This is such a fun game for multiplication, and it's very strategic if, if y'all want to look, or you can look in a minute. Again, I use pinto beans because I cheat. Um, <laughs> but here's the game. You have the, your digits across the bottom. The first player is going to pick, uh, I think I'll do seven times four because I know that. Okay, so I get to cover. Um, <laughs> 28. Four times eight is 32, so you get to cover that. The goal is to get four in a row. So the one next bean. player comes along, and they say, and they can only move one bean. Oh. So they're going, I, I kind of want to block them, so is there something I can do to block them? Let's see, 20. Yeah, if I put this on five, I'm going to take 20. Okay, and you can get a different color bean, so they're blocking each other. And then you go, okay, I'll go up. So that, four times six, ha! And you can get that so one. So it's like connect four in a way. Kind of, yeah. but they're having yeah. to think ahead where the product is and yeah. where they would have to move the bean to get nice. the product. So it's a good strategy game, but it's getting them really thinking about their facts. So that's there, and that's that's for, there's a few. There's more over in Ms. Sharon's room if you need them. Okay. Okay, so these are the take-it-home games. Um, this is just for your, they have flat pieces of paper, and they had to predict which measurement's going to make the biggest volume box. So they predicted first, and then they made their boxes. And we talked about how... Um, People in the, in the world of uh, finance make decisions based on a lot of this stuff. And so I had them say, if you went to the store and bought cereal, which box would you buy? And nobody got the largest volume. So I told them, you know, this is your eye. You can't trust your eye. you got to trust the math. Because, and, and people know that who produce boxes and they make this one look really pretty. But this one has more in it. So, um, so we talk a lot about just real world kind of stuff like that and being very critical thinkers and buyers and stuff. This is my volume game they played today, and it's getting them to focus on volume as, as not just length times width times height, but the area of the base times height. So if you want to take one of these to play this game, you just pick one of these. You put a marker on it and say, I want this one. So first they have to figure out the area of the base, not by counting the squares, but hopefully they're doing length times width. And that's their first point. And then they roll dice to get the height. So then they have to multiply whatever they have on the base times height. And the reason I teach this as base times height is when they get a cylinder, once they know how to get the area of the circle, they've got a cylinder as well. It's base times height. So um, they played this today in class. They seemed to like it. A couple of them wanted to take it for recess. Go figure. Um, <laughs> and you can take one of these. I don't have much, many of them made, but we love to do secret codes in class by using ordered pairs. So they have a grid with the letters on the grid, but instead of putting the letters, you have to give me the ordered pair to write me a message. So if you want to take one of those and just have it home and write, like, clean up your room on um, <laughs> order pairs, you can do that. Um, <laughs> that's a long one. And I have a few. Um, if I can make more of these if somebody wants them at home. It just takes me a while because I get them laminated and they can write on them in markers. This one's really cool, though. Um, the fun
promotion game uh, is is really going to follow them in later grades. And I can't believe we already we already do this, but we do. Um, we're talk we yeah. we had an X and a Y queen king up here, but they had to follow a rule. So Y never knew what to do until X told them what their value was. So the way the game is played, you you would put like a four here. I draw my card with the rule on it. This is a hard one. Okay, <laughs> be twenty two. So I could put twenty two here. So four twenty two. So the students thinking, how do you get from four to twenty two? Anybody got an idea? Times five plus two. Yeah. Times five plus two. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So if they can't get it with the first move, they can pick another x and another y. And and then the points they get is the number of tries it took before they can figure out the rules. And the person with the lowest points wins because they're the ones that can figure out the rules faster. There, some of them are simpler, like multiply by ten. But um, this is. They're going to do a lot of this stuff as they go up in middle school and high school and then graphing it on coordinate grids. So really, a lot of the skills they're learning this year are real foundational for a lot of stuff they're going to do um, on into the future. Um, these, again, these are laminated and um, a lot of card stock. So if you're interested, why don't I put out a sign-up sheet if you want something like that for home? Because I love when they can play games to actually practice their math. This one's cool because it's kind of like that other one. I might say, you know, what's double six plus three or whatever, or some multiplication fact, they have to find the answer, but they have to give it to you with the ordered pair where the answer is. So it's a lot of mental stuff going on. And the answer's on your card, so you don't have to do any mental work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, you can see we do a lot of visuals. We do incredible amount of hands-on work. Um, it's a very busy place. Uh, I'm just trying to get a grasp of it this year because it is new. And trying to make the order work because it seems a little funky for me right now. I'd really like to teach place value first because I think everything depends on that, but I got my marching orders. So <laughs> I am doing, doing a lot of other teachers. <laughs> yeah. so, uh, I do have a question about the volume because that yeah. one was a little bit confused with mm -hmm. last night and mm -hmm. it was when I got home, so I wasn't quite sure what we were talking about. That's so funny. Mm -hmm. she She loves to participate. I, I just love having her here. Seventh year in the fifth grade math. And this year, the curriculum has changed for the first time since I've been in fifth grade. So we had everything running along really smoothly, and then we got thrown a, uh, this something new. Um, and really, the standards haven't changed that much, slightly, and they've dropped some things or moved some things to other grade levels. But um, basically, we're doing um, multiplication and division, and addition and subtraction with fractions decimals, whole numbers, we do coordinate grids, line graphs, numerical and kind of categorical data, order of operations, volume, um, what am I leaving out, uh, geometry, um, I think I've hit just about everything, writing expressions, things like that, but I feel like everything in fifth grade math is very foundational going into middle school and high school. We started out this year doing coordinate grids, line graphs, and data. And you can see some of the data we've done on, in the hallway. We got on Google the Chromebooks and made graphs. So we're, I'm trying to teach them how to use technology to show what they want to show. I chose immigration because we're reading Esperanza Rising, and it, Im immigration's a big topic now in the country. So I thought, I, and I told them, I said, you know, you can use data to argue any point. So you got to be real critical of what you look at. So what we looked up was the population of the United States since 1850 and the immigrant population of the United States. And, and when they look to the immigrant population, it goes like that. And when they look at the U.S. population, it goes like that. So what we said is, if I wanted to say no more immigrants, I'd show up and say, look, we have so many more immigrants. But if I want to really tell the true picture, the percentage of immigrants today is less than it was like 1840, but 1940. It's pretty, pretty steady. We're like 13%. So I was talking about if you take both the pieces of data and put them together, you can argue both sides. So um, I'm trying to really make the critical thinkers about that. And, and the book you're reading in, um, in our reading class is is awesome. And it's about a girl and her family who have to move here, and they work in the farms in California um, around the early in the century. Um, um, and they were immigrants, so this, it's just a topic I wanted them to talk about. We also graphed um, Hurricane Fran when um, Florence was coming, <laughs> just to see wind speed and how hurricanes work, and so a lot of stuff like that. In math, we started out with coordinate grids, 
And I had a couple of games that we, um, these are available for them to play every morning. I don't have these available to take home right now. If you want one, I can make one for you, but these have to be laminated, and I've just, I've got like 15 of them made across the grade level, but if you would like that. This basically has a coordinate grid, um, and it has numbers on it, and card questions, like it might be a fact question, four times eight, and they can find 32 on here, but they can't say 32. They have to say where is 32 on the grid using an ordered pair. So um, this was kind of challenging and fun. This one was a function game where they had to um, actually tell what was the effect of um, y, what happened to y based on a rule that happened to x. So it's um, getting them ready for functions in middle school and high school. And they uh, actually did pretty well with this. So that's some of the things that we did at the beginning of the year. Um, I feel like I'm saying completely different things than I did in the first session, so let me back up. We've only had these kids about 17, 18 days. So I don't feel like I know them very well yet, as far as knowing what they can do. Plus the skills we're working on in math are not real computational. I haven't really gotten to see how well they multiply divide um, much. Um, but every year, knowing our math facts is a real weakness with students. So what I've prepared for tonight for you to take home is some things to get them to practice their math facts without, uh, and try to be fun um, without just flashing cards at them. I know that some people never um, remember their math facts, even as adults. It's just really hard to memorize. So we're going to talk a lot about patterns um, and how you work with numbers so they can get to answers quicker if they don't memorize their facts. Um, I do not give time tests. I think I, did I say that? Um, I think it's very stressful to tell somebody they have to produce quickly or else. Um, so <laughs> I like people who process things and think about things and uh, problem solvers. So. Uh, but I will tell you, just to make it fun, this is a take-home game to practice your math facts. And I try to produce things out of things you can get anywhere. Um, these are just popsicle sticks that I've written the, num uh, the number 0 through 9 on. And inside the baggie is five different games you can play. And you can make it really competitive with them. You can play with them. It's kind of fun. Game one, uh, you flip the sticks in the air and the ones that land face up, you have to add them. So that's like a lot of mental math going on. They can get paper if they want to, but it's kind of fun to see if they can do it in their head. Number two is a subtraction game. You start with 100 and you have to subtract what turns up. So that's harder. Um, number three has um, multiplying. Um, number four is you get to choose whether you want to add this, all the sticks or multiply two of them. And they qu quickly find out that multiplying is going to give them a higher number and they can beat you. So that kind of is the motivation for them to know their multiplication facts. And game number five is, has to do with a, a unit we haven't done yet, but order of operations, where they can pick a, a number between 1 and 50 as their target. The example here says you have a target of 39. You flip your sticks, and if you have like a 3, 5, 8, and 6 land, they have to make an equation that can be any operation to get as close to 39 as possible. So I did 8 times 6 minus 3 plus 5. Um, so that'll be a little bit more challenging, but all those games can just come out of throwing sticks in the air. Um, so this is one that you can take home. Another one that you're welcome to take, and if you don't mind, we'll just, and again, I like to make it a little bit competitive so that they get excited about learning this. But this game, you have your digits across the bottom, and the first player gets to pick two digits, and I'm just using fingers to show you can use anything at home. Um, I want to cover four in a row, so I might find a number. I'm, I think I'm going to go for the, the middle, so I'm going to try to cover that 30. So I can put a bean on five and a bean on six. Five times six is 30. I get that spot, right? Mm -hmm. And then it's the next player's turn, and they say, hmm, I'm going to block them. So you get to move one bean only, but I'm looking at my numbers and go, if I move this to the two, whoops, I can cover that 10. You can get two different colors of beans so you can see. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'm going, well, I can't go that way anymore, and I can't get four that way, so let me try this way. Uh, five. Oh, just move one to one. Five times one. And then I get to... So there's strategy going on of looking for the products and then thinking what factors you need to make that product. And uh, I don't know. It's, it's, it can get kind of fun and hairy, but <laughs> that's one that you can take home. I've got um, some right here if you'd like this. So those are my two take-home games tonight to help them practice their facts at home. On the back of the sheet that you took at the door are some websites. Websites to visit that some of them are flashcards. There's one that's like an arcade uh, 
car game, but they're still having to do multiplication packs, or I think they can choose another operation. Quick Strike Math is what I emailed you about. It's kind of cool to put on a phone or a tablet, and they can do it in the car. Just a fast back practice thing where the numbers are floating around, and they have to poke it, have to find it. Um, next week, coming home in your purple folders will be a sign-on card to get into a program called Freckle, and it is standards-based. They go in and take a diagnostic test for each standard, and then it will place them in one set. So it might take them down, you know, geometry, it might take them down to a, a third grade skill that they missed. And maybe they, in, in some other standard, they might be right at a fifth grade level and just keep going higher. So it tries to fill gaps and put them at the level they need to be at. Um, so all that is attached here. Um, and then I'll just show you what we're working on right now. So we're working on volume currently. Your children made these boxes. Um, we had a lot of fun with that. We were trying to figure out what had the largest volume from a flat piece of paper before they made it. And then they had to measure and cut, and that was so challenging. <laughs> Using a ruler and figuring out which way the ruler goes to get a distance from the side was, we were exhausted at the end of the day. Um, but it comes out really pretty. And that a lot of the kids predicted the box with the highest sides is going to have the most volume. It's like a gum box. <laughs> so they got tickled by finding out that. The highest volume, do y'all know which one? Which one do you think has the highest volume? Can hold the most? Maybe the orange one? This one? Yeah. Okay, I'll pull that out. That looks pretty roomy, doesn't it? Looks like you could put a lot in that. Do you agree? Okay. Red? Red? Okay. This is the one the kids always pick. They love this one. They're like, red, red, it's got to be the red. So we were talking about if you went to the grocery store and you saw cracker boxes, which one would you buy? And they're like, red, definitely red. <laughs> it's this one. Really? Oh, really. And so we, it, it's really interesting. And so we talked about how um, marketing and, and making things like this can be very deceptive to consumers. So they should check weights when they're wanting to see what they're getting inside the box. But also the value of mathematics because you can't eyeball and know what's going on. It's really hard to tell volume by looking. Um, so with ice cream, they have started to make the same price. They don't want to know what's going on. Exactly. Yeah. The size. Exactly. Yeah. We talk a lot about that, just to be um, really savvy consumers and, and critical thinkers. But the game that we played today in volume, and you're also free to take this one if you'd like. The children played it in class, and we are trying to. We all. Uh, they kind of discovered through playing with these prisms that they made, that length times width times height gave them the number of cubic units. Um, so they actually kind of wrote that themselves. They figured it out. But then I started telling them, wait a minute, length times width, isn't that something you did last year with area? So these are just areas at the base of a prism. So the way they play this game, I want them to think of volume as area of the base times height for this reason. When they get older and they're good in triangular prisms and cylinders, it's still area of the base times height. They just have to get area of a different kind of base. So the way they played this game, you just have the paper down, and they would play back and forth with the partner, and they would pick which area they want, and they can put whatever they want. I'll take that one. So they'd say, okay, this is my base. What's the area of the base? And hopefully they're multiplying length times width. So this one's four times five. So it's like I've got 20 points to start. And then you can roll dice to see what the height is. How many levels of 20 do you have? So we'd roll the dice, and I ran it on two. So 20 times two, I get 40 points for that round. So the next player can come up and say, I'm going to take this one. It looks like it has a lot of squares in it to get a lot of points. So there was some strategy. For an extra challenge in class, I was letting some of them use dice that went up to 19 or 12 just to get higher factors. Um, but you're welcome to take one of these home and um, practice volume with that as length times width times height, but also the area of the base times height. Um, and I think I've shown you everything I had up. All of my secret code things are taken. Um, I'll, show, I'll show you what we did. The kids love these. When we did coordinate grids, we also wrote each other messages. But instead of, <laughs> the way, I don't know, it's not an instead of. The way to count the letter was to go to the hot spot on the grid according to the ordered pair write the letter down and then figure out the secret message and they were writing me messages. Um, <laughs> I was like, I got 60 messages. Uh, but it, you know, it's fun. Um, and I had some paper, but really you could take, uh, I've got some little graph paper here. You can do it if you are interested.
the last group I said, you should write a message that says clean your room and do it on a coordinate grid. <laughs> but I just got some graph paper, so basically you can just put the alphabet around, number it, and then write them a message. And just, just for an extra practice for something fun at home, you're welcome to some of these if you would like. Um, does, uh, you can see that we do a lot of visual, a lot of hands-on, um, a lot of vocabulary in mathematics. So, um, and, and I like to teach the history of mathematics as well. We'll talk about that zero came from um, the Hindu. Uh, the Egyptians studied how to make rectangles and triangles and right angles and using rope, and we'll do that in class at some point. Um, and uh, we studied Rene Descartes, because he's the one that came up with the idea of the square root of zero. A philosopher. So. <laughs> Just try to keep it fresh and fun. And but if you have any questions or concerns or excitement, <laughs> I talk too fast. I know. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be honest with you. It's hard now. We just have an hour, twenty minutes to teach the math, and now we got fifty-five. Mm -hmm. So it's a big, it's a few hours. concept and then let's practice it for 20 minutes. It's more like teach a concept. <laughs> Bye. Um, and, we, and we move pretty fast. But, uh, oh, I did want to say at the bottom of the sheet, I forgot to tell the last class. I do parent classes, parent math classes, and we try to make it fun. It's not stressful at all. And um, But at the bottom it says my first one's going to be on October 10th. And I offer one at 4 o'clock from 4 to 5 and then another one from 6 to 7. Hopefully I can hit everybody's schedule. And when you come in for a parent class, I show you exactly what we're doing in class and how I'm teaching it. So when they have questions at home, you, you're all, because nobody learned math the way we do it now. I mean, I teach the algorithms that everybody knows, but also I teach a lot of other methods that back up the algorithm and explain the algorithm. And um, I know it's kind of threatening sometimes when your kids come home and they're doing everything they can and they've ever seen. So I'd like for you to feel comfortable with it. And we have fun in here. And we play games and talk. So you're welcome yeah. to come to that yeah, session in a couple of weeks. Any questions? Can I have a question? Sure. I think we are not in the nineties, so we don't get all the money. Because, uh, yeah, you're probably right, because it's by our classrooms. Yes. <laughs> So is in any way we can communicate with you? Yes. Or we'll get the information you're giving to the other students? Yeah, you'll get some information that doesn't I'll put them in so that you get all of my information as well. So, yeah, I can do that. If you will just write down your email, and I can add it to the class pad. Are you doing class pad? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So if you'll just put your email, I can... We're, we're working a whole lot with character and um, reading this book has gotten to talk about a lot of really emotional things, I guess. Um, Esperanza was a very wealthy little girl in Mexico, and then she had some tragedies happen, and she had to end up moving to the United States to work on a migrant farm. And, uh, going from riches to rags, and just the kind of opinion she has about people and how it evolves through the book. It's really interesting. So, uh, yeah. yeah, great book. Thank you so much. Be sure to take, um, if you'd like to take one of the games home, and then um, yeah. just get in there, get, get, get some competition going with your kids. And yeah. two people raising their hand. Well, you know, we don't learn anything by never doing it. That's just a fact. So we talk a lot about how the brain grows and how the brain makes connections. And if you don't renew and strengthen those connections, it's gone. So, uh, yeah.
Yeah, and you know, it's funny because a lot of people talk about how with technology we're not going to really need to know those things, but to me it's great to have some knowledge in your brain when you walk around so you don't have to pull out a phone to figure out everything you do. And so I like to do a lot of animal math with the kids and um, not have them depending on technology. Yeah, I mean, if they're in a job where they're figuring out really difficult algorithms, of course they're going to use a computer, but if they're in the grocery store, I would like them to be able to do some in crisis without... Um, well, it kills me. It's happened twice now in the last few months. So we're in the fast food line, and it comes to, well, yeah, you know, $12.04. And I'll tell them, oh, wait, let me just get the four cents out. I don't want 96 cents in change back. And the person is just completely, they don't know what to do. And it's so like, not on the cash register. Then they have to call over their supervisor. How much change? Because they've already assumed what I was going to hand them. And we drove away. Well. <laughs> oh, my gosh. It's like, hey, what is this minus that? And she can sell me. And yeah. yet, the well, they just don't have to do it. When I, right, I, the kids think I'm a dinosaur. Cash. When I tell them my story, my first job, there were no cash mm -hmm. registers. Mm -hmm. They'd come up and get a hot dog and fries and a drink, and I'm in my head going, oh, that's a dollar seventy-five plus spring. And that's how I learned to do math by playing games like Monopoly and doing stuff like that. And and I said, and they would hand me my money, and I would count up. I'm a real big person on counting up to subtract. And they do it with fractions. When you're subtracting fractions, instead of having to do all this regrouping with fractions, count up. And last year, the kids really bought into it. It's much easier. But for them to count up money, if you're at 43 and you're going, what What do you need to get to? I don't know. 45? It's, it's just an alien thing to them. So they, they, they really struggle with that. But if you can get them thinking that way in lower grades and ask, we, we use number lines. I don't have my number line here yet. This feels really weird this year. Um, but thinking about the distance between numbers and the relationship between numbers is so important. Um, and how you find errors in your work by looking at what's absolutely unreasonable. I need to hush. Oh, no, no, no. Beautiful. No, it's so... Uh... No. I'll start over with you. No, they're they're sure. tired of me. <laughs> I, I, I'm really not worried. I, she's in good hands. She's in good hands. I'm going to laugh, but you're sitting in Layla's seat. Oh, really? I don't know that. <laughs> you didn't know that. I don't I'm know laughing because I'm like, oh, look, Layla's sitting in front of me. It's nice. <laughs> but, yeah, that's, that's all I have, unless y'all have anything else. You're very welcome. I'm sorry I talked so fast. Nah, nah. And this is the game you say? Yes, I'll show that to you in just a minute. You're always doing awesome stuff. <laughs>